Second Corinthians chapter 11 is our destination this morning, and we're going to start reading in verse number 1. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. I feel a divine jealousy for you, for I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted, because I preached God's word to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the region of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And what I do, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted ministry, mission, they work on the same terms we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness." their end will correspond to their deeds. I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not with the Lord's authority, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast, for you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear with it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. Let's pray together. Father God, we pray now that you would send your Holy Spirit, uh, so that we might love the Lord Jesus, so that we might be satisfied in the Lord Jesus so that we might be sustained by the Lord Jesus all through your word. Father God, we pray you would send your spirit so that we might see and savour your son in the pages of your word. Lord Jesus, we pray this morning that as we see you, our hearts would be thrilled. Father, that we would not have forgotten our first love, but that love that we have for you would rise as we experience the love that you have for us. Lord Jesus, please help me. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. So what happens when a church isn't healthy? What happens when a church is not a healthy church? What happens to the heart of a godly leader when he sees his people being led astray? The final movement of 2 Corinthians from chapter 10 through to chapter 13 deal with those questions, and they are some of the most personal, powerful, heart-wrenching words ever to come from the inspired pen of the Apostle Paul. How does Paul react to the continuing presence and threat of false teachers and false teaching in Corinth? How should we react to false teachers and false teaching? How does Paul deal with the lack of loyalty in the Corinthian church that he loves so much? 
it's important for us to remember that Paul's concern is not himself. Paul is not empire building. Remember last week in chapter 10 verses 15 and 16, Paul wants gospel health for the sake of gospel growth. Paul wants gospel peace in Corinth so he can take the gospel elsewhere. His concern is for, is for the Corinthian church to be healthy so that he can go to Spain and preach the gospel somewhere new. Paul wants this to be a healthy church. And as he addresses the concerns he has about the church, we can reverse engineer what we think Paul thinks a healthy church is. Brothers and sisters, we need Paul's definition of a healthy church. We need Paul's definition. We need the Bible's definition of what Christian health looks like. One of the big uh, convictions, challenges about um, studying the Bible verse by verse, particularly the New Testament, particularly Paul's letters, is that so often the things that we value, the things that we think are so important, appear to mean nothing to the Apostle Paul whatsoever. What's a healthy church? Uh, is Is it a church with an engaging speaker who always wraps up so you get out on time? Is it a church where you always sing your favourite songs so you feel closer to God? Is it a church where your kids are never bored? Well, maybe you won't be surprised to hear that Paul doesn't mention any of those things as he encourages the Corinthians towards church health. We see here in these first six verses that healthy churches need spiritual integrity. Healthy churches need spiritual integrity integrity look at verse one with me i wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness do bear with me paul says here the 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 self-consciousness in the apostle he says hey i'm gonna be a fool bear with me paul knows what he's about to say particularly in this chapter and in chapter 12 is awkward for him it pushes him out of his comfort zone Because Paul loves the Corinthians, he leaves his comfort zone. Because Paul is concerned about their spiritual health, he leaves his comfort zone. He does things he's not altogether comfortable with. He does things he's not altogether, he doesn't find them easy to do. The Corinthians' spiritual well-being depended on Paul leaving his comfort zone. Brothers and sisters, there is someone in your life whose spiritual well-being depends on you leaving your spiritual comfort zone. There's someone you work with whose spiritual health depends on you leaving your comfort zone, walking across the, the shop floor or whatever it is, and saying, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. There's someone that you know who needs you to be brave for the sake of their spiritual health parents what what your children need is for you to be brave for the sake of their spiritual health not raising them according to the increasingly insane secular standards of the world but raising them in the nurture and admonition of the lord you have to leave your comfort zone to do that husbands what your wife needs more than anything is for you to leave your spiritual comfort zone and go deep with jesus for the sake of your marriage for the sake of your family What our church needs is for all of us to commit out of our comfort zone and out of this place where where everything's sort of set and easy and familiar and regular and let's go with Jesus outside of our comfort zone. The end of Hebrews encourages us to go to Jesus outside the camp, outside of comfort, outside of ease, outside of the cultural norms. Because when we leave our comfort zone to find Jesus, what do we discover? That Jesus is so much better than we think he is. The reason we get comfortable, the reason we we don't commit to reading and living out the word of God, the reason we don't commit to faithfully, generously giving our money is because we don't really think Jesus is as good as he says he is. We think we need to have some sort of backup plan. And then we, 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 we abandon our comfort zone, we come to Jesus and we discover life and peace and joy 10,000 times better than what we could possibly imagine. Friends, what this city needs 
is Christians out of their comfort zone. Uh, about nine o'clock this morning, I was talking to a guy uh, who shut up early from the gym or to use the gym. Uh, we're, we're just talking about, about life in, in Champagne. He said, man, I've lived here for 20 years and I like it pretty good, but it just seems like things are slowly getting worse. And, and then he said, it just feels like things are slowly getting worse everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Listen, there's fog in the world because there's mist in the church. <laughs> of, 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 of course, a godless world is getting worse and worse. If a church isn't leaving its comfort zone and getting better and better and higher and higher and closer and closer to Jesus. So you can watch the news or however you consume information and you can lament how discouraging and unsettling so much of the news is. Or you can do the Christian thing and say, man, I need to commit to my relationship with Jesus for the sake of my family, for the sake of my neighbours, for the sake of my co-workers. Paul left his comfort zone for the sake of this church and you and I must do the same thing. See how Paul loves this church in the next, uh, in the next verse, in verse 2 there. Paul says, I feel a divine jealousy for you. For I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. You and me, every Christian, all of us, all together, from now to the day we die, all of us are heading for a wedding. Read the book of Revelation. What happens in Revelation? What's the end of Revelation? A wedding. What happens at the end of time? A wedding where the church, the pure bride of Christ, is presented to her groom, the Lord Jesus, and we are with him forever. Paul's aim is the aim of every faithful pastor to introduce the people he loves to the saviour he loves, to prepare the church for her wedding day. To say with John the Baptist in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 29, being the friend of the groom who delights to introduce him to his brides. See, being a Christian is not about what you do, although there are some things you should do if you're a Christian. Being a Christian is not even really about who you are, although your identity is radically different if you're a Christian. Underneath your identity is this relationship. Being a Christian is about having Jesus. Not knowing things about Jesus. Not acting like Jesus even, although you should do those things. But fundamentally, right down at its core, being a Christian is about having Jesus. It's about saying, I'll leave the world, I'll leave the city, I'll go out into the wilderness, I'll, 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 I'll go out of the suburbs, and I will go to where Jesus is. We say with Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 16, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. That's the Christian faith. I belong to Jesus, and Jesus belongs to me. This is how Paul encourages the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3.23. He says, hey, you belong to Jesus. You are Christ's. You have him and he has you. Paul again in Philippians 3.8 says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's the spirit that turned the world upside down in the first century. Everything was loss for Paul. And then Paul doesn't list bad things in Philippians chapter 3. I only spotted this this week. Paul doesn't list negative things in, in Philippians chapter 3. He lists positive things. He lists good things. He lists valuable things. And he says, it's all loss compared to having Jesus. Healthy churches need spiritual integrity, which means we run headlong all the time after Jesus. And we realize again and again and again, Man, Jesus is much better than I thought he was. Much more satisfying. The Lord Jesus is better than everything you have to give up to have him. Bad things, sure, and good things. This is the Jesus we meet in the pages of Scripture. But Paul's concern is that the Corinthians are losing grip on the real Jesus. 
Right, the Corinthian church existed to make the real Jesus impossible to ignore in Corinth and beyond. Just like you and me, we're here this morning because we exist to make the real Jesus impossible to ignore in Champaign and beyond. But the Corinthians were losing grip on the real Jesus. Verse 3, For I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Paul looks at the Corinthians and he sees that they are being tempted just like Eve was being tempted. Eve was tempted to to doubt God's goodness. Did God really say? Eve was tempted to doubt God's sufficiency. Eve was tempted to doubt the satisfaction that comes from obeying God's word. And Paul looks at the Corinthians, he looks at the the direction that church is going in, and he sees exactly the same thing. Because brothers and sisters, the devil has never, ever, ever had to change his tactics. All he does all the time is get us to doubt God's goodness that's why we sin that's why we're not generous that's why we're not bold in proclamation we don't really believe all the way down that God is good and if we don't really believe all the way down that God is good we certainly don't believe all the way down that God is good to us we think oh I'm this I'm that I'm the other I'm a sinner I'm disqualified maybe Jesus tolerates me but he doesn't love me friends listen get in the gospels And meet a Jesus who loves you with an absolutely shocking disregard to how well you behave. And let that Jesus change your life. And when you sin, as you will sin, go to Jesus. And see the scars that he still bears right now in heaven on his hands for you and see the wound in his side where they pierced him with a spear for you and in that blood find restoration and hope Paul sees this church is losing its spiritual integrity they were being deceived as Eve was. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, problem number one, another Jesus. Who, who is the modern Jesus? Somewhere between, like, you know, your pal and a vending machine. Who's the modern Jesus? He's like part granddad, handing out candy to everyone who asks. Completely different from the Jesus we meet in scripture completely different from the jesus who demands from the jesus who saves listen friends the real jesus will mess up your life that's the truth because when you come to him you you can't keep any of you the real jesus will mess up your life but here's the other side of that only the real jesus can actually save you so you can have a fakey jesus who just sort of sits there on your shoulder cheering you on, never demanding, always affirming. You can have that Jesus. The problem is he's not going to save you from your sin. Or you can have the Jesus that bleeds and dies for you and demands that as he has given everything to you, you would give everything to him. Another Jesus, a different spirit. A spirit that focuses on experience, not sanctification. And we touched on this um, last week, didn't we? Listen, brothers and sisters, I am thankful for the real, deep, rich experiences I've had of the Holy Spirit in my life. I can take you to the three different places that they happened. 
the campus of the University of Reading, the tiny little box room in the house I rented uh, my first year after college when I lay on the floor and my forehead was against one wall and my feet were flat against another wall. That's the second time it happened. The, the road outside Belleville Free Will Baptist Church in Greenville, North Carolina, the three times that I've met with the Lord most powerfully. I thank God for those experiences, but those experiences mean nothing unless the Holy Spirit is growing me in holiness. It is your holiness, it is your sanctification, it is your progress in the faith that gives us assurance, that brings us to Jesus much more than our experiences. This is what Peter says in, uh, in his first letter. In First Peter, he says, Hey, yeah, I was there on the Mount of Transfiguration. I saw the Lord Jesus transfigured in all his glory. And then he says, but you've got the Bible, that's better different Jesus, a different spirit preaching a different gospel. Paul doesn't give us the details of this different gospel, but, but, but given how much time Paul spends talking about his suffering in these final few chapters, probably it was the health and wealth gospel that was infecting the church in Corinth. Or the self-esteem gospel, the Jesus just wants you to be happy gospel, the Jesus just wants you to be comfortable gospel, the Jesus wants you to, to keep up with your neighbours and have all the stuff they have gospel. The gospel that sends people to hell. That's the different gospel. These Corinthians had been led astray by the skilled speaking and smooth arguments of false teachers, but Paul offers them the knowledge that leads to health the knowledge of Christ-centered spiritual integrity. Friends, we need the real Jesus at the center. We need our faces in the Bible, our hearts filled with the Spirit, our mouths singing because of the gospel, because we have met the real Jesus. Healthy churches are built on self-sacrifice. Look at verse 7 through 11 with me. Paul says, did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way as the truth of Christ is in me this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. Healthy churches are built on self-sacrifice. We see in verse 7, Paul's focus is others, not himself. He preached God's gospel free of charge. Verse 8 shows us that Paul came to serve, not to be served. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. Verse 9 shows us that, yes, Paul has needs, but he will not be a burden on the Corinthian church. It, it is astonishing and convicting that it was the Macedonian church who had nothing who supplied Paul's needs while he was in Corinth. This was all for the sake of counter-cultural love. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the region of Achaia. Achaia was like the state where Corinth was. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows that I do. Why, why does Paul ask in verse 7, did I commit a sin? And why in verse 11... Is he dealing with the accusation that he doesn't love the Corinthians? Well, I think it was because in that Corinthian culture, you showed someone you loved them by accepting gifts from them. And the Corinthian, and Paul hadn't accepted any gifts from the Corinthians. So they say, hey, this guy doesn't love us. This guy is committing a sin. You see now, now, you're thinking exactly the right thing. You're thinking, well, the Corinthians didn't offer Paul any gifts. That's the whole point of this passage. Paul had to do it all by himself. Well, friends, the, the devil isn't consistent. 
You understand that? The, the devil is inconsistent. If he can get you to sin by telling you A, he'll tell you A. If he can get you to sin by telling you not A, he'll tell you not A. Maybe exactly at the same time. He doesn't care how he gets you to sin. He doesn't care how he creates division. He's just going to do it. He doesn't need to be consistent. Paul loves this church. It shouldn't surprise us that healthy churches are built on self-sacrifice. Because our faith is built on the Lord's self-sacrifice. It shouldn't surprise us that what Paul mentions here in his ministry to Corinth sounds so much like the Lord's ministry to us. Because our whole church, healthy churches everywhere, are built on the Lord's self-sacrifice. The, the, the other side of the coin is, is demon worship. The other side of the coin is demonic. There's no neutral. There's no grey. You are moving towards Jesus or you're moving towards the devil. There's nothing in the middle. Verse 12, what I do, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder. For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. So Paul will continue to self-sacrifice for the sake of the Corinthians and to make himself look different from the false teachers. And these false teachers disguise themselves as angels of light, just like Satan. False teachers are always nice. It's the orthodox like Paul that we think of as a bit grumpy and slightly annoyed. False teachers are always nice. They come, like the devil, disguised as an angel of light. It shouldn't surprise us that both the founders of Mormonism and Islam went off into the desert, saw an angel of light, and then came back with their false religions. Of course they did. That's exactly how we should expect false religion to start. Healthy churches are committed to self-sacrifice. We give ourselves for others' good because, friends, the Lord Jesus has given himself for our good. Finally, healthy churches must have the right categories. Healthy churches must have the right categories. Let's read verses 16 through 21 together. Verse 16, I repeat, let no one think me foolish. Oh, but even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I too may boast a little. For what I'm saying with this boastful confidence, I say not with the Lord's authority, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourself. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. Paul knows boasting is foolish. But apparently foolish boasting is, is what impresses the Corinthians, so he's going to give it a try. But see what Paul boasts in? Paul says, oh, we were too weak to be like your really impressive super apostle false teachers. Paul boasts in not being like the abusive and impressive false teachers. I think Paul is trying to provoke the Corinthians out of their worldly categories, out of their flesh-inspired worldview. And if we're going to be healthy Christians, if we're going to have a healthy church, we must have spiritual categories. We must not define strength and weakness and success and failure the way the world does. We mustn't aim at what we're told is impressive or what looks impressive, but what the Word, the, what the word of God defines as impressive. A lot has changed in the world since Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. But brothers and sisters, you and I are still tempted to believe that more is more. 
you and I are still tempted to believe that bigger is better. The Corinthians were deceived because they did not leave their fleshly categories behind when they came to Jesus. We must not make their mistake. So what do we have? Well, in Jesus we have everything. In Jesus we have everything we need for strength. In Jesus we have everything we need for health. Brothers and sisters, you and I have the word of God and we have prayer. The only weapons we need. We have bread and juice reminding us of the cross. We have the truth. We have the truth. I was talking to someone about coming to church this week and, and I said, Here, here's what we value at Bridge Church. You know, we, we value the truth. We value the truth. We, we want to be serious about the truth because life is short and eternity is long and hell is hot. So let's be serious about the truth. At British Church, I think we value each other. I think we value community. And the thing I'm most excited about about our church is that, you know, when you, when you value the truth and when you value each other, you stop feeling like you have to pretend. You stop feeling like you have to pretend. Are you a sinner? Oh, me too. Have you done things this week that have made you ashamed of yourself? Me too. Is your only hope in Jesus? Me too. Do you learn that a little bit more every week? Me too. Does Jesus get better the worse you get? Me too. You don't have to pretend. We recognise, as we get to know Jesus and as we go deep in the scriptures, that, listen, slow growth, slow growth is still real growth. Slow growth is real growth. Look, you're, you're not where you want to be. You know, me neither. I thought I'd be way more sanctified by now. Oh, but brothers and sisters, you're not where you were. Thank God. Three years ago today was, was the first time uh, in the old Bradley building that, that I preached at Bridge Church. Me and Rachel were just on the verge of losing our minds and moving to Illinois. It's just about to happen. Have the last three years gone exactly as I thought and hoped they would? No. <laughs> of course they haven't. Is Jesus better than I thought he was three years ago? Yeah, Absolutely. Is our church growing in the important ways? I think so. Does our church have a lot of growth ahead of it? Yeah. Is it going to happen as we follow Jesus? It's the only way it's going to happen. Listen, I... I can't guarantee you anything because the word of God doesn't guarantee us anything. Not, not in the temporal, not, not in the short term. Friends, we're, we're either going to succeed following Jesus or we're going to fail following Jesus. But either way, we're going to follow Jesus. Either way, we're going to strive to live our lives according to the categories of this word. Either way, we're going to strive to live our lives so that we love Jesus a little bit more every Sunday. And so that as we gather, we enjoy him. This is our spiritual integrity. This is our hope as a church. And our church will only be healthy as long as we remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross. You, Christian, individually, will only be healthy as long as you remember what Jesus has done for you on the cross. We're a forgetful people. But God loves us, so he has given us a reminder of what he's done for us. And we call that reminder communion. And we're going to conclude our time together by celebrating communion together. 
And, and as we eat the wafer, we're going to remember it should have been my body that was broken for my sin. But it was Jesus' body instead. As we drink the juice, we're going to remember it should have been my blood that was shed for my sin. But Jesus' blood was shed instead. As Free Will Baptists, we practice what's called open communion, which means you, you don't have to be a member of our church family to celebrate with us. Whether you, this is your first time here, whether you've been here for longer than I have, if you're a Christian, you are welcome. You don't have to be a member of this church to celebrate with us, but, but you do have to be a member of the church to celebrate with us. So if you're not a Christian this morning or you're not sure, as others around you eat and drink, just sit there and, and enjoy. And if you're not sure about your faith, man, we're so glad you're here. We're so glad that you're here.